Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Werner. I am the Executive Director of Penn's Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. Welcome to our virtual seminar, The Financial Impact of COVID-19 on Healthcare Providers. For those of you who don't know, the LDI is Penn's hub for health-related research. It's dedicated to data-driven, policy-focused research that improves our nation's health and healthcare. Part of our goal is to facilitate and advance conversations that are important to today's world. And so as part of that, we're gathered here today. Thanks for joining us in that conversation. As you all know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a tremendous financial toll on our healthcare system. Data to date show that COVID-19 has affected healthcare delivery in profound ways with a decline in visits um, and clinical activities, consequent reductions in revenues and healthcare workforce resulting in potential economic distress across the healthcare sector. Back in March and April alone, about 1.5 million healthcare jobs were lost due to the pandemic. And while there has been some recovery, healthcare is down about three quarters of a million jobs since February of 2020. Here in Philadelphia, just last week, one of the major health systems, Jefferson Health, announced that it, it was eliminating 500 jobs after a drop in patient cash flow last spring of around a billion dollars. Financial fallout of the pandemic has been felt throughout the healthcare delivery system. Telehealth has offered some relief as a partial substitute for clinical care and a partial financial boost, um, as has direct assistance from the federal and state governments. But for many in healthcare, there has been a clear sense of economic peril that remains across the healthcare sectors and across healthcare providers. With that very brief background, I am today looking forward to an important conversation with our panelists to discuss the pandemic's financial impact on healthcare and health systems, outpatient practices, and community health centers, and also how to preserve the financial integrity of our health system as we move forward. With that, let me introduce our tremendous uh, group of panelists. We have um, Rebecca Gee, who is CEO of the Louisiana State University's Healthcare Services Division. Dr. Gee previously served as Louisiana's health, Secretary of Health, where she led the state's Medicaid expansion and oversaw efforts to improve healthcare quality and access, maternal mortality, and pharmaceutical pricing. Evan Mahoney is CEO of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. He has led transformative projects to expand Penn Medicine's clinical care, teaching, and research, including the construction of Penn Medicine's new hospital and the implementation of a common electronic health record across the platform. Andy Martinez-Patterson is Vice President of Government Affairs at the California Primary Care Association, which supports and advances the mission of nearly 1,400 community clinics and health centers that serve millions of low-income Californians. She is responsible for shaping the vision and execution of the policy strategy to achieve their organization's success and mission. And then finally, Farzad Mastashari is co-founder and CEO of Alidaid, a network of accountable care organizations that partners with primary care providers to facilitate the shift from fee-for-service to value-based care. He was previously the National Coordinator for Health IT at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So with that, I would like to start with a round of questions to the panelists to help set the stage. I mean, hear a little bit about each of the healthcare sectors that you all work in, uh, how the pandemic has affected operations and how it's affected finances. So Kevin, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, during the early part of the pandemic, hospitals and health systems in the area suspended all elective and non-urgent procedures and admissions in anticipation, in anticipation of a surge of COVID admissions to the hospitals. It resulted obviously in plummeting patient revenues and patient census. I'd like to begin the conversation just by asking you um, what you what it looked like from your vantage point at the time. In Philadelphia, as we prepared for the surge in the pandemic last March, what was the financial outlook for hospitals and health systems? Sure, thank you, uh, Rachel. Thanks for having us uh, on, on the panel. I'm looking forward to this. Um, Philadelphia and, and Penn Medicine were not that much different than the, the rest of the nation. Uh, you know, the timing was slightly different. Our, our wave hit in uh, early March, uh, roughly uh, March uh, 6th and 7th is when we trace it back in, in Philadelphia. And, you know, we did the right thing. Uh, we, we shut down uh, uh, non-essential uh, visits. We shut down elective surgery and we bought more PPE at uh, price gouging uh, levels than, than you can ever imagine. And, um, uh, but we, we learned. And we learned quickly how to uh, better take care of uh, COVID-19 patients. And we learned as a society 
uh, the, the simple steps that were needed of wearing a mask and, and social distancing. Um, so we had an acceleration of expenses. A, a, a good example is I still have $400,000 worth of ventilators that we bought because there was a belief everyone was going to end up on a ventilator until we found out the mechanical ventilation actually prolonged the, the patient's stay. Uh, so we quickly pivoted. So, I, you know, I, again, I think the, the hospital sector took a giant hit. But I think the lesson that uh, we learned is, um, you know, we hear the new normal. There's nothing new or normal about a pandemic, but it was an, an acceleration of trends. And it laid bare how dependent hospitals are on commercially insured elective procedures. And without them, we, we, we don't make money. And, and we need to use this as a clarion call to, to reset and, and to, to move forward on, on the value initiatives that uh, Farzan and uh, I, I know Andy uh, will, will talk about. But we, we can no longer exist. You mentioned uh, some of the problems in other health systems in, in Philadelphia. When you're laying people off or not funding their 403B, that is, we're all going down the drain together. And, and we need to, to shift to where the patients are, which is more ambulatory and virtual, and we need to get there in a hurry. Yeah, so I think those are great, uh, a wide range of topics, important topics that I hope to cover over the course of the hour today. Um, I wonder if, so right now the country is facing um, its third surge of the COVID pandemic. Here in Philadelphia, the case rates are certainly going up. What did we learn from the early days of the pandemic that affect your uh, management of the Penn health system moving forward as we brace for this third wave of the pandemic? So we, we learned what the rest of the country did. Testing is critical, but being able to manage patients at home is even more. We, we manage as many COVID patients through an app we developed called COVID Watch where we do remote remote monitoring, pulse oximetry, keep track of patients at home, bringing them into a, a congregate care, uh, in, into a hospital setting is not ideal. So I, I think we learned several things. Get upstream. So we got upstream on nursing homes. We got upstream on uh, congregate uh, apartments, uh, you know, where people uh, tend to have uh, bigger outbreaks. And we got upstream by trying to manage the patient in their home environment for remote monitoring as opposed to bringing them into the hospital. Okay. So Farzad, um, like hospitals, outpatient practices were also battered by the COVID pandemic. Um, there are some estimates there were a 60% reduction in visit volumes during the first months of the crisis. After months of having severely reduced patient volume and revenue, some practices are fa facing closure and financial ruin. Can you tell us a little bit about COVID-19 and how it's affected office-based practices? And specifically, tell us about independent practices in the United States. Yeah. So as you pointed out, we work just with independent primary care practices. We're in 30 states, about 700 different practices, different segments of practices, everything from solo docs to IPAs, multi-specialty clinics, and federally qualified health centers. So I can say a little bit about the range of those. I should qualify, though, our practices are the best case scenario, right? Why? For two reasons. One, they uh, have all engaged in alternative payment models and value-based care models, which have given them a significant, I think, alternative diversity in their, in their revenue. So that's worth noting. And two, they're part of something bigger than just themselves as an independent practice. So when um, we called our incident command on March 12th, we stopped visits to the practices and we intensely focused on what it would take to help them just survive. And the first thing, as Kevin pointed out, was PPE. We, like, the, if the supply chain for hospitals was broken, imagine what it was like for these small practices. They literally could not get the masks to protect themselves, and we literally had um, practices who were exposed, who had to quarantine their staff. And when you quarantine your doctor who's running the, the, the staff revenue, the office closes. And so this, this, this insanity that in the midst of the pandemic, we're laying people off, and shutting down healthcare really does point out, as Kevin said, the insanity of a fee-for-service payment model, where unless you can, you know, keep up the RVUs, right, you're you're going out of you're going out of business, regardless of what the needs of the population are. So we immediately, you know, said, okay, we got to find some way of getting PPE to these practices. We eventually procured 360,000 masks 
we became experts in U.S. customs <laughs> uh, hmm. from China uh, and the KN95 masks and gloves and gowns and all the rest of it and distributed over a million dollars of PPE for free to these practices just so they could stay in business. And then the second thing we realized was we got to tell the patients to stay home. Uh, and uh, we sent out, you know, 100,000 postcards and coaching people on particularly the vulnerable patients who we prioritized on what they need to do to stay safe um, and, and uh, not expose themselves or others. And then we said we got to continue to deliver primary care, right? And we can't not have, have that, that thread to care be snapped right now. So we, within a weekend, we stood up 150 practices on telehealth. Uh, and as you pointed out, we saw about 50% drop in total um, practice volume across the entire system. Obviously, some states harder hit than others. About half of that was made up by telehealth. Uh, we're now back up almost to, to prior visit levels, and we're still seeing about 15% of the total visits are telehealth. So there was a big drop off from, you know, in terms of percent of practice, percent of visits that were done by telehealth. Um, but it's still, I think, a significant contributor to helping the practice sustain business. And then finally, we help them find whatever, uh, com you know, and, and it's pretty complex, but all the different loan programs and the grant programs, the accelerated payments and all the rest of it, of how they could access those programs and advocated for more and simpler uh, payment methods for those. None of our practices went out of business, and I don't think any of them are going to go out of business, and many of them got, you know, checks, a few hundred thousand dollar checks. Um, uh, as part of their shared savings distributions, whether from Medicare or commercial payers, which I think, you know, I know goes a long way towards helping them uh, stay solvent. But we still are seeing a, a decrease in total primary care delivery at the time when we can ill afford it. Great. Thank you for laying the groundwork in that. Um, Andy, I want to move to you. Um, so you represent community health centers in your organization. And community health centers like hospitals and independent practices um, suffered a lot, have been suffering a lot under the COVID pandemic. They certainly are, have played a very important role in the United States in providing care for patients who otherwise have not had easy access to the healthcare system. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how the community health centers that you work with have been affected by the pandemic and what their financial outlook looks like. Yeah, happy to, and thanks for having us. Um, I'm not sure how much the audience knows about community health centers. I think if you have not had to go to one, you probably didn't even know they exist, so I'm always happy to tout that the United States has this amazing primary care system that was created close to the civil rights movement um, and really meant to be access and comprehensive, and health centers are hopefully the model of care that the United States and the United States will embrace moving forward. Dental, it's behavioral, it's primary care, some do optometric, a lot do acupuncture, pain management, substance use disorder services in low, low income underserved communities, um, usually by people who look like the communities that they serve. So it's a really amazing, fantastic model, though predominantly it is for low income um, and black and brown folks, especially in California. The numbers are pretty amazing um, and they're it's so, in some ways devastating because it reflects the amount of poverty that's in the United States, but health centers in the United States serve 30 million people, so that's one in 10. Um, in California, we serve one in six. Uh, we serve seven million in California, and um, there are 14,000 sites across the United States, also in Puerto Rico. California, we have about 1,400 sites. Um, so everything that has been said on the on the panel so far, and I know it's Farzad is, na is national. You know, we've got Penn in Louisiana, so that's East Coast. California has had a few pandemics, not just um, COVID. We've also had fires and then this horrible air quality situation. So climate change pandemic is hitting us so hard. Um, and it's it's created a bit of a catastrophe, but health centers are, are really sturdy and they're gritty and they always figure it out, but it's been really tough. So because we're also the preponderance of our payment comes from fee for service. We were really challenged when everybody was said not to go to the doctor. So revenues dropped dramatically, just like everybody else was saying. Fortunately, in California, we had the opportunity. We have a close relationship with our Medicaid department. And what felt like in my mind two weeks to try to get the telehealth flexibility for payment because prior to COVID, it was not paid for. Um, we got it in three days. We got the flexibility and full payment, and I cannot underscore the importance of that payment in 
as a lifeboat to keeping us afloat because we would have we would have closed. Health centers did close some sites in California and I'm sure nationally, but I don't know that it's permanent as far as I would say. I don't know that we're going to see a lot of closures. We might see some mergers where it just makes sense now um, and this was a tipping point. But for the most part, we're doing better. Telephonic care has what has saved us. We've tried really hard with telehealth um, on the face-to-face -face and the Zoom type uh, visits, but it's hard for a lot of the patient population. Some of our elderly patients are really not into it yet. Our own staff are trying to learn an entirely new delivery system and workflows and helping people acclimate to this new type of a visit model. There was a lot of folks that just didn't, didn't want to engage with it. So we've been working on it a lot. Telephone has saved us. It has dramatically improved behavioral health no-show. We used to have like 40, 50% no-show rates in behavioral health. Now we have some health centers reporting zero. We've got folks who have never come in, like Latino men who have anxiety disorders doing behavioral health visits for the first time. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us with telehealth. Um, and telephonic is the same. So that's that has saved us. And the other thing to just mention is the PPE. PPE price gouging has been crazy. Uh, California was insane. Um, and it still goes. It's an ebb and flow. We're trying to push our state to be the purchaser so that all the rest of we don't have to have millions of people across California trying to compete against one another for boxes of masks. We haven't quite gotten there yet. And then the last thing is that because health centers really should be on the front lines of the testing and the monitoring and all of that, but because we're fee for service, it made it really hard when we had no staff and we were sending everyone home to also bend inwards into the system to do testing. And in California, you couldn't be paid for doing a test. You had to either have a full visit, but you couldn't be paid for a test. So that that was really challenging. And so it's definitely forced a lot of new thinking and pushing us on why did we think about the system that way before and then um, implode so quickly. But um, I would say that we're standing strong and um, we're doing pretty well despite all of the challenges. Thank you. And then Rebecca, um, let's move to you and Louisiana. So you're at LSU, which is um, a state-funded institution, so a little bit different than uh, what we have here at Penn Medicine, um, it's, in that it depends partly on, uh, more so on the state's budget. The state's budget obviously has been stretched to a breaking point by reduced tax revenues and increased social spending during the pandemic. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what specific challenges LSU Health System faced as a state-funded institution during Sure, and thanks so much for having me today. Um, I have uh, I'm both a graduate of Penn as well as on the board of Chive, and so I'm proud to be a part of this August group. Um, let me just paint a picture of Louisiana for you. Louisiana, shaped like a boot, population a little bit south of 5 million, one of the three lowest income states in the nation, um, one of only three states where 40% or more of our people live below 200% of poverty. And in fact, one in three of our adult population is on Medicaid. And when the governor and I expanded Medicaid in 2016, about one in four adults was uninsured. We then uh, moved the population to insurance with an average of 8% uninsurance rate, which is below the national average. Now we're a little north of that at nine. Um, but, but a relatively stably insured population, which distinguishes us from other deep south states and our neighboring states like Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, Florida, states that ha did not have a Medicaid expansion have really had a disaster on their hands. Um, like Kevin, we, we had similar situations in terms of our parabola of COVID. We started early. We had Mardi Gras here in New Orleans. 1.4 million people came in our, into our city before we knew COVID was circulating. And so our um, March numbers looked really bad. And um, in March, we were one of the states that had the highest compression in terms of PPE and vents. And in fact, we had the highest growth of COVID in the world, even higher than Northern Italy at that time. Um, but we've had good leadership, both governor of our state as well as the mayor of New Orleans have been very, very data driven and have had mask uh, mask enforcement. In fact, yesterday our mayor announced a $500 fine if you do not wear a mask uh, in a place of business. So with the, that leadership has led to really um, uh, community spread here in New Orleans of less than 2%, in fact, just a little bit north of one. So that's good. Um, LSU is our state's flagship land grant university. So our camp, we have uh, a lot of assets, including a veterinary school, uh, A&M campuses throughout the state, partnerships um, with a variety of institutions, including, including across North and South, and our residents and fellows have an enormous impact on our state. In fact, we provide through them about 8% of the employed physician workforce for the state. 
Um, and we partner, uh, post Bobby Jindal, we used to operate hospitals that were founded by uh, the Catholic charity system. LSU took them over in the 90s, and we ran them until Jindal changed them into a public-private operator system. And so we are reliant now on joint contracts that we, we get from the state and or lease agreements that we have through our buildings and, and historical institutions and the partners that operate them. So it's been a really challenging time. Um, we have gotten CARES Act funding, but only about $5 million for the entire LSU campus, which is not a lot. And revenue, um, the state budget uh, shortfall is about a billion dollars in the current year and about $300 million in this current budget year. And so, uh, you know, it's been a challenge. And so we're facing also the, the notion, I mean, the catastrophic job losses. So in Louisiana, about 36% of our employed population prior to COVID has, has put in an unemployment claim. So we don't think that, that things are going to change anytime soon. And so we, like Kevin and Andy, have shifted to um, virtual visits. Um, and But we have also led the state in terms of testing and in terms of virtual accessibility. In fact, LSU, within a few weeks of COVID, stood up a statewide free primary care telemedicine service for every resident in the state. We've been uh, providing testing. But we have had to do that well in partnership with federal um, and state entities, and we've gotten funds um, through those entities, including our partner hospitals, that have helped support our mission of providing the testing um, and and some of the other um, needs for the state, including our own engineering labs for you know creating PPE on 3D printers and that kind of thing. So we've had a variety of demands on LSU, both uh, from our land grant status and the capabilities we have, as well as our um, hospitals are residents. Um, so far, we are managing. We've had about a $12 million decrease in clinical revenues, but managing to keep all of our staff employed and, and move things along. And so you know, the future is unclear depending on what the next stimulus bill looks like and, and whether there can be an agreement on that. And certainly the funds that go to states uh, and cities are very important to institutions like LSU who, who rely much more than, than Kevin does on Medicaid dollars because of our low-income population. Okay, thanks. So I want to talk about two, two things. Um, first, I want to talk about, um, you, you've all mentioned the role of uh, telehealth and virtual technologies to help sort of fill the gap. Um, in the ability to provide in-person care. And I think in the setting of this fee-for-service system that we're working in from a financial standpoint, it's been key to keeping health systems afloat. So I first want to talk about the role of telehealth, and then I want to get to whether that fee-for-system um, system is really sustainable. So regarding telehealth, Farzad, I'm going to uh, start with you. As a former, um, uh, formerly uh, working at health IT at a national level, can you tell us a little bit about your um, your view of the role of telehealth? Is it here to stay? And how can we think about it as a part of partial solution to the financial crisis that we're seeing here? Yeah, the, the telehealth um, adoption issue has not really been a technology issue. Uh, it's been a, a payment and regulatory um, issue. And uh, I think we saw, as, as was pointed out, how quickly the system can move, right? When Andy said, within days, we got the way, like, it had been a decade's worth of progress in, in literally days that, that occurred. Um, on the payment side, you know, on the regulatory side, OCR, the Office of the Inspector General, and then the, the state, uh, uh, the interstate credentialing, all that, all that kind of fell away. And it showed what could happen if people really, really need it to happen. On the payment side, the big concern has been around uh, substitution versus addition. And uh, the, the concern from the payer side, from the Medicare and the policy side has been, is telehealth going to just substitute for an in-person visit, in which case that could be great? Uh, or is it just going to be layering on more and more and more visits um, and making it hard, frankly, to make sure that there's... Um, the, the necessity for those visits. Inconvenience oftentimes serves as a check on inappropriate and excessive utilization, let's face it. And so the concern from a policy point of view is gonna be if we continue to pay for telehealth visits, what is the impact long-term gonna be on the Medicare trust fund and, and on payers? Um, and what is the potential for fraud? And I think the, the solution, I know there's a lot of, of advocacy to say, let's just continue 
the current provisions over the long run. And I guess I might be a little bit of a dissenter on this and say what we maybe should do is um, use this as a way to extend those flexibilities uh, to organizations, groups, providers who are actually taking risk on total cost of care for whom uh, those um, they don't have the churning incentives on, on the traditional fee-for-service system. And again, use this crisis as an opportunity to help push the system more away from fee-for-service and towards things like capitated uh, payment models. Yeah, so we will get back to a, uh, hopefully a robust conversation about that, but uh, that's a great start to that. Kevin. No, I, I would add to what Farzad was saying. Um, you know, we quickly pivoted to uh, virtual health, but muscle memory has brought it back. As the pandemic is eased, patients are, are and returning, and we're just going back to the old way. And where, where we have seen it sustained is in those uh, bundles where, where there's one economic payment, as, as you understand, and you know, post-op surgery and, and things like that are all being done virtually. And I, I'm with Farzad. I, I, I worry that if you eliminate the access completely, healthcare spending is just going to uh, uh, go up. Um, if you eliminate the barrier to access. But there are very specific areas, risk contracts and uh, bundles, where virtual health is just, it, it is the way to go and something that we should push forward very quickly. Can I chime in here? Of course. So we are, um, I, I don't disagree um, on fee-for-service. I think what we've seen is there's, in addition to, are people just going to start calling and patients every day and just start billing all the time and checking in with people? Um, or, or maybe it's not as valuable. There's questions of the value of a virtual as compared to the face-to-face. -face, but I, I really want to challenge payers in whose value are we talking about? Because a low-income person who has to miss a whole day of work, the value to that person is dramatic to just jump on the phone with a nurse or whomever it is to calm and, and not go to the hospital that night for whatever reason. Any mother who has a baby probably knows this feeling. It's excellent, and I've seen it, and I'm, I'm commercially insured, and I have access to telehealth, and I certainly don't abuse it. Um, it has helped me avoid many probably costly hospital room visits that were unnecessary. Um, so to me, I really want us to question value. <clears throat> and I also, you know, within three days, we got telehealth in California. And a month later, because I didn't want to overwhelm our Department of Medical Services, was like, so now let's move to alternate payment methodology. Because obviously, fee-for-service doesn't make any sense at all, and we all know this. And we need to have keep the flexibility of telehealth, because one of the concerns for a lot of uh, primary care providers is, I, d I don't know how to do population health. I know how to do fee-for-service. I have an entire infrastructure, millions of dollars of training and staff invested in this, I don't know how to do the other one, but COVID has shown us, well, you actually know how to flip it like in a month. We actually could turn into a whole delivery system. Hopefully people have more confidence. Um, our state, so what I had asked them to do, and allegedly, and I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised by this, everyone was asking for something similar, to take 2019 financials and turn them into a capitation and just stabilize and say, do what you got to do. Go out and test. We will keep you funded. Our state did not. We were dropping. We were like, 60 billion in the hole at some point. They weren't able to do that, but we're talking about it now. We're back at the table talking about alternative payment methodology. I just really don't want payers to say a, a virtual is less valuable and to start weaning it because then the pay, then the provider says, well, then face-to-face -face is more financially beneficial, so I'm not going to do any telehealth because I'm losing money over that. We need to incentivize yeah. the right changes in the delivery system to move it, and we do have to move away from fee-for-service. We should not keep it permanently and have all the fraud and abuse, but I also would say we've got a lot of protections in the system to prevent fraud and abuse. That should not be what we're protecting ourselves from because that's how we got into the situation to begin with. We should have been doing this for 10 years. We just were so afraid of fraud and abuse that we weren't. Can I just add one one thing? On the behavioral health side, this is has been absolutely miraculous, almost. Like we, we see, and, and particularly the issue of the no-shows that were, you know, incredibly high, and to see those uh, dwindle down to almost almost nothing. So there's clearly some room for, um, for this to become the preferred method of delivering care. There's obviously other kinds of care, like, you know, people with uh, blood pressure where Medicare won't pay for a home blood pressure monitor, you know, 
it doesn't do you very good, to, much good to do a virtual visit with a patient. I want to highlight one commercial payer uh, who, to my knowledge, has done the best response to this, which is um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, where they launched what they called Accelerate the Value, and they did exactly what Andy suggested. They said, we're going to give you what we paid you in 2019. We're just going to give that to you for independent primary care practices. We will hold you harmless on that. The only requirement is you stay in business, you keep your doors open, you don't sell yourself, uh, and you move to a value-based model if you're not already in one. So to me, that was the perfect example of how you can combine survival during COVID with the transition to, um, to value. One of my concerns is the muscle memory that Kevin talked about is we, we know, and, and as Andy so well stated, that low-income populations are particularly benefited by teleservices. They just have such difficulty with transportation and um, time off of work and so on that it is it is really been a meaningful shift for them. And so it's a shame if we land on the same runway that we took off on. You know, we need to build a new runway and that has to be a runway that is built on value-based payments. And in states like Louisiana that are still so fee-for-service driven and um, arguably uh, we don't have the data infrastructure, and that's our main impediment. And so the, the question is, what is the private sector going to do, and, and how could CMS lead building a new chassis for value-based payment, particularly, I think, and most acute for Medicaid clients or individuals who have difficulty, because they're not going to want to go back to the old way of doing things. Um, but another thing is, what do we know and don't know? We don't know a lot about the quality of telemedicine. I just served on NCQA's panel looking at quality and value in telemedicine. There's some press gainy customer satisfaction data, but we really don't know who is the right patient for a telemedicine encounter, what types of encounters are optimal for telemedicine, and who, um, you know, and, and what should we anticipate and what does need to happen in a hospital. And I believe we, should, we need to move to a, move, uh, a, a system very much like what Doug Eby has created in Alaska, where the default is telemedicine for everyone. And I'm a practicing gynecologist. But I had, clin I had clinic last week and about 80% of my patients did not need to be there. We could have done a televisit. They would have been happier. I would have been happier. We would have saved a lot of money. So the question is, how do you build that as the understanding that that is your foundation? And then if you need to go to in-person care, you do. Um, but to do that, uh, we need to have, uh, we need to not shift back to muscle memory. So I'd love to ask Kevin, you know, what do you think would be needed for Penn you know, it's a little bit easier, I think, for an LSU where we rely on Medicaid funding. We can work with our state. We can look at state contracts and, you know, and we do population health just because so many people pass through, um, you know, the walls of our clinics. But how in the private sector and, and what discussions have you been having in terms of how you would like to change in the future? And, and have you seen any payers? Um, as far as I mentioned, Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, which, which and I think that's fantastic. But are there any other national payers that we know of that have really shifted? So Philly's not um, a great example of national payers because we're dominated by a local Blue Cross, and and Aetna and Optum and others have not uh, United have not had a lot of penetration. I I, I think the the only way we're going to go forward is with a much closer payer provider relationship. So an, an example, uh, treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, EPOC, uh, we did at home uh, during the pandemic. It, it's normally in a hospital bed. And, and we, we'll save 800 hospital days uh, by doing it a, at home, which means Blue Cross is going to benefit by 800 hospital days, and I'm going to lose payment on 800 hospital days. So I don't want to get into the risk business. You know, whole risk, whole life risk is not... I don't want to be an insurance company. I want to be a hospital. But there has to be some sharing of the, the revenue back and forth so that when we come up with the savings, that it, it doesn't all accrue to the benefit of the, of the payer. And we're working closely with our local Blue Cross on that, similar to uh, North Carolina, as far as I had mentioned. Okay. Thank you. So um, you guys have moved on to the payment discussion already, but I wanted to ask a, sort of a more specific question about that. And Farzad, maybe I'll start with you. Um, I was looking at some survey results this morning, um, which suggested that um, surveys of independent of, of outpatient practices, um, smaller practices continue to prefer, even during the pandemic, a fee-for-service uh, payments over alternative payment systems, while larger practices seem to have a, a, a bigger preference for global payment. And I think it's understandable given uh, the risk they have to bear. 
Can you talk a little bit about how COVID pandemic has affected your thinking about alternative payment methods and what you've seen in the practices that you've worked with in terms of their thinking? Um, I think it's harder for small practices to uh, be able to take downside risk um, and to have an, an adequate uh, risk pool size to even out some of the year-to-year -year variability. Um, and cash flow is harder for the practices. Uh, you know, Kevin and Rebecca can plan over a multi-year project. They can invest now and, um, and and reap the benefits years down the line. Smaller practices don't have the ability to have as long an, an aperture. So uh, I think that's where enablers like like Allidade can can be helpful, have been helpful in terms of bringing in those smaller practices into value-based and payment models, everything up to 100% uh, upside downside risk sharing by serving as as the, the 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 group that helps you think longer term and provides the capital um and the and the confidence that that you can uh, that you can succeed the one thing that i've seen change is more talk of primary care capitated payments but there's still a fair amount of hesitancy on the part of the practices to embrace those and actually uh, zeke uh and, and amal have a uh, have a i think or have an interesting take on uh, primary care capitated payments that provide a little bit more continuity with what um, with what was uh, paid before, so it's not as disruptive a, a change. I think that's going to be an interesting model to keep an eye on. Is will we see more of a primary care cap plus total cost of care risk sharing? But I will say, from the appetite of practices to engage to move to alternative payment models. During COVID, I thought we were going to have to basically shut down growth at, at, at our company, right? It was like, who's going to, who's going to have the bandwidth to think about, you know, these new contract types and, and working on something new? Like, let's maybe, do we take the year off on growth, you know? And then Medicare said, uh, oh, um, you know, no new ACO deals for, for 2021 completely. Like they just shut it down entirely. And then we couldn't visit practices to do that, right? So all of these things were weighing against us having a big growth year. And we had the biggest growth year than we've ever had in independent practices wanting to embrace alternative payment models. I mean, California, actually, Andy, was our single biggest state for growth in this, despite all of the triple pandemics that were going on. So I, I'm an optimist by nature, but I think there's some data to suggest that we are going to see an actual accel this accelerate movement, including of independent practices towards alternative payment models. Andy, do you want to comment on the role of alternative payment models in the work that you're doing? Yeah, so I, I mean, the moment COVID hit, so I've been working on trying to get an APM in California for almost 10 years now. And we had one so close, didn't get it across the line. It required uh, legal mechanisms that we weren't willing to stomach, but we were so close. Um, and I figured, oh, now everyone's going to say, oh, that's what we need. We need the APM. Everyone will finally be jumping up and down. But there's a ton of fatigue and just overall overwhelmed uh, feelings among providers and the CEOs and terror that this they lost a, a whole bunch of money that we haven't made up and they'll never make it up. And now on top of having to figure out all this telehealth stuff, they have to reconfigure their entire delivery system for a new way of payment that their suspect, the suspicion is they're trying to, the government's trying to take money away from me. So you want me to jump into this right now? So, I mean, I have some folks who are like, yes, finally, please sign me up. But a whole bunch of folks who are just so tired, so, so tired from healthcare change. Healthcare, we are asking them to change all the time, endlessly change. And this is a pretty dramatic change because really, in our model right now, we're constantly looking for billable providers. Where's the net billable provider, an MD, a DO? I need all of these expensive providers that I can never find, and that's where we structure all of our staff around. And now I'm saying, you actually, in a new model, you don't really need those folks as much. Now you need a whole bunch more promotoras, you need more health workers, you need case managers, you need nurses. And so now you're asking them to flip all that over, and no one's offering any money to do it. In fact, Folks like Farzad and Seema Verma are saying, you should really take some downside risk at the same time. So come to my party and you only get to eat a little bit or you're gonna have to pay money, some of it back. So there's some amount of this, like, I don't know that I want to, 
but we are at the table in California. Um, and I will say in Oregon of the health centers, they did an APM eight years ago that is very similar to what we are aiming to achieve. And they, no one has ever gone back. No one wants to go back. There is a subset of rural and smaller providers in, in Oregon that don't want to do it because they don't have the right payer mix. They're just not really sure that it will work for them. But they weathered the COVID storm far better, I would say, than other health centers because they were stabilized. They had an incentive actually to go out, not to pull back and contract, but rather to lean into the system. So there is, but in California, we have two years. We've already have a timeline. It's gonna take us two years to probably talk about it, build it up again, model it, get CMS to approve it, and then implement it, because it just takes that long. So I'm hoping that that amount of time lets people just kind of stretch, do some yoga, figure the whole thing out that they can do this. They can absolutely do this. And because it's for health centers, but there's always a way out. There's always the way out. For me, I think the big question is, I know that you know APMs and alternative payments have been going on for dec a decade, at least a couple of decades. And now there's this realization that you've really got to have skin in the game. But if you want people to change who they are and ask them to risk at the same time, it's almost an impossible ask of them unless they're forced to do it. And if they're forced to do it, they're going to fight you in that process. So my advice to our state, because we're not opposed to the concept of risk, but I'm asking them to graduate it. And especially if you have low income, really complicated patients in the world now recognizes what public health long has known, social determinants of health are the thing impeding most of what you're doing. So how, we have to have a way of kind of graduating into what we pay for social determinants of health and helping providers feel like they're making some progress and not being penalized for the world around them in this new change. So graduate in APM, hit risk later after people feel like they have a little bit of their feet underneath them. And the last thing I would just say is that we have to get pretty clear on the standards that we're measuring folks by. That terrifies everybody because everybody, every plan, every Medicaid, every county measures differently. And then that really disrupts all that we're trying to achieve together. And let me just add my support for even though I was lunching with Seema Verma on there, Andy, uh, let me add my support for your um, your uh, proposal that the risk be um, uh, feathered in, and and you start off with one-sided uh, models, and and then after two or three years you graduate. We but you know health centers we have four health center only ACOs, um, and all four of them made savings, uh, millions of dollars that really helped their their bottom lines. Health centers can absolutely be very successful in. Yeah, in these models, but you're right that it needs, it takes time for them to gain the confidence. Kevin, I wanted to get you to weigh in on alternative payment models. There's certainly, um, uh, looking forward for hospital revenues, the shift from um, fee-for-service to alternative payment models, the, may, the time may have come. I think particularly during the COVID pandemic, the number of people who are commercially insured has declined and the number of people insured by Medicaid is gonna go up, which is gonna certainly affect bottom line under a fee-for-service system. Tell us your thoughts about alternative payment models and what would it take for Penn Medicine to convert to more alternative payment models? So I, I am advocating for that, that move at, at Penn Medicine. I mean, we're we're highly successful and, and we, we, we won't go lightly into a new model, but it's my goal that over the next, you know, five, five to six, seven years, I can get Penn Medicine more closely aligned with an alternative payment method uh, uh, system. In particular, and, and I'll just use uh, Philadelphia and Chicago as examples. Philadelphia, we just had our 22nd hospital close since 1980. And Chicago just announced their 14th closure in the last 20 years. So there's only going to be a few inpatient facilities left. And my alternative payment method is not just value, but also how do we build an ambulatory uh, safety net where, where people don't have to come to the hospitals? And Rebecca, I know, is trying to do this down in, uh, in New Orleans. But it, it's not – I need a method where everyone is not uninsure, underinsured. I need a method where I can gain, uh, the more efficient I become, the, the, the more financially stable I become. And, and right now it's, uh, we're, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but it's actually the incentive is the opposite. That the, the, the private payers are coming to my hospitals, the local hospitals are, are stuck with 
um, uh, under, un, uninsured or underinsured uh, patients, which leads to their closures. So when I, uh, to summarize, when I think of APM, it's not just how medicine benefits, but how, how does the, the region maintain uh, that uh, public safety net, which is so critical uh, and, and it is really starting to show uh, signs of wear, at least in, in two cities that I quoted. Rachel, I just want to mention, look, I mean, Medicaid is so such a particular challenge. I mean, Louisiana, we've despite the fact that we were already low income, we've had a 50,000 person shift into Medicaid in a COVID era. And Medicaid presents particular challenges. Number one, um, you know, Medicaid is a state federal partnership and state budgets are capped. Medicaid is often one of the largest portions of your state budget. And so, um, you know, when Medicaid goes up, you really threaten K through 12 education, corrections, roads, and all of these other things. And the policy debates are really important. And yet, we don't have really meaningful tools for states to use. We don't allow states to negotiate drug prices. We don't allow the states to, to do three year actuarial running um, contracts with managed care plans so that they can really lock it in and, and try to get value for long term investments. And so we're because of the way Medicaid is structured, we lock ourselves into a fee for service system. And also because of the way that Medicaid supplemental payments are organized um, and are often not necessarily related to quality or value. Um, all of that needs to change. But the things that, that Andy was talking about, something like a block grant program, which could really be impactful in, in terms of social determinants, are things that people are extremely skittish about on the Democrat side. You know, Bill Cassidy's proposal was all about, you know, federal block grants. The problem is there hasn't been an honest discussion about all of the things that Medicaid pays for. Medicaid pays for GME. You know, Medicaid pays for um, facility depreciation for, for uh, you know, and so there are all of these things. We need to have an honest discussion about what we're paying for and why so that we can get to the other side of something that, that looks like true reform. And it's challenging because there is no federal architecture for Medicaid for those of us who are so, so reliant on it, nor is there a data infrastructure that we can um, in, relate from one state to another to really understand what's going on. So I think that's really important going forward for us to really think about how we organize CMS and the architecture uh, for understanding quality and value and allow states and help states to do it. Because the other compression you always have is although you may want to do these things, you do not have the staff at the state level to make the kinds of improvements that would be needed to support even some of the things that Andy's able to do with FQHCs, um, who have a federal an organizing federal architecture and some more, you know, more guidance in terms of and, and surety that if you go in a certain direction, you're going to get paid next year if you do it. So just there, there, you know, there, there are all kinds of competing forces that just make true reform difficult. <laughs> Medicaid is. I'm learning now about supplemental payments and running my head into the wall feels better than how we're trying to, it's, and, and I would admit California, our, our association is very uncomfortable with block grants, even though I, I totally appreciate the hypocrisy of me saying, give me an APM, don't ask me what I'm doing, but don't give me a block grant. For the, mm -hmm. I understand that hypocrisy. The political dynamics of our country though, I think terrify us. Right. And that's where we get so, and, but I but I think you're right. We should have a conversation about it because we are constant. The other thing that's a little, little bit of the mind bender on APM is it's always tied back to fee for service. Right. You're always kind, of, and that just hurts your head about how. So we're moving it, but we're really not. Then you have to come back and redo a rate in fee for service. I don't understand. And as we're trying to figure out how do you, you know, for me, what's always fascinated me about health centers is that they do this stuff we don't typically count in value. Like, does how does it matter that the dietitian is, you know, an African-American woman who comes from your community and she talked to you because you're an African-American too? How much does that matter as opposed to what if the person called you on the phone and offered you a food service? Like, is there a difference there? And we've never, mm -hmm. health centers are not, we are not mandated to provide certain types of data in the same way. We get paid no matter what. So we, we don't have a great data set to, quantify this and we can't actually value all the intrinsic value of what health centers bring. And now when we were asking folks when we were first trying to develop an APM and we were like, well, let's try to quantify all the extra stuff that you do. 
everyone was like, so what? So my dietitian is worth two, but that that nurse is three points. Like, how, how do you actually value that? And how are we going to value? I heard recently that there's um, a project to try to value and Z code social determinants of health elements. But my, what our folks would say back to me is so they're like, so you want us to go away from volume, but then quantify more volume at the same time. So where that, I really want us to have a national discussion about the madness that we create, even though I love data, it helps me as a policy person, but too much data then is that it ruins the game. So how are we, we have to shift how we talk about value and the rules and open it up. So I think you're totally right on about the big conversation with at least public health insurance. I was wondering if Rebecca would would agree to have FMAP rates go up as a way of providing some of that assistance to the states that are really hurting, but tie it to increased adoption of APMs. Yeah, no, and look, that's already happened in relation to COVID and also post-2008 you know, crisis. We, there was a bump in FMAP. I think those things can be helpful. I think the challenge is the politics of Medicaid, right? So for Louisiana, that would be a really helpful discussion. And then you've got all these laggard states that just will not ensure their adult populations with Medicaid expansion, despite the fact that it is extremely helpful to your state budget, your bottom line. We've, we've, we've been able to have billions of new dollars come into our state, no hospital closures, no rural hospital closures. You know, So you've got to have that. The challenge is how do you incentivize states that are being budget stupid? you know, and are just not going to do these things uh, for ideological reasons. Um, and so, so, and that's where I think we, we, again, back to how do you have a, either, either kind of force it by making it so economically necessary that states just can't do it. That's what the governor did when we expanded Medicaid. We just built it into the budget and it would have caused another 400 million of cuts if the legislature wouldn't have supported it. So that's the kind of thing you do, but you've got it. CMS just sent to have some rules. So about about how this the, the rules of the game because the most vulnerable people in this country do not have the kind of access to Medicaid that they should. I want to end with talking a little bit about vulnerable populations. We're coming up to the top of the hour. It's been a great conversation, um, and but I want to give each of you a chance just to to talk a little bit about what we've been sort of dancing around here, which is how we address racial inequities in the post-COVID era. So certainly COVID-19 has reminded us all of the profound inequities that exist among poor communities and communities of color in the healthcare system. So I want you to tell us what you think the health care, what healthcare should look like going forward. What could we do to address racial inequities as we move forward um, during the pandemic and after the pandemic? Kevin, I'm gonna start with you. So I'll, I'll only address it from uh, my, my perspective and um, what we did was we put our money where our mouth is and we built it into the top 600 executives at Penn Medicine. Our incentive pay is tied to reducing maternal morbidity and mortality among black and brown population and increasing colorectal screening among our black population. And if we don't make those improvements, we don't get paid. It, it's, it's taking money out of your paycheck and we know that incentives work. So we, we, we're, we're tired of talking about it we're going to take dramatic action, but we're doing it by impacting the higher paid people's paycheck. And, and you wish it didn't have to come to that, but that is the way we know that we can move the needle. And I'll be happy to report next year. I, I know we'll have achieved these goals because we build them in. That's great. Thank you. Farza? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, in the aftermath of George Floyd, I wrote that I was ashamed that we had been sympathetic bystanders uh, in the past to racial disparities. And we had had an assumption that if we're doing population health and we're focusing on everybody, then, you know, it's, it's like, it's good and it'll help racial disparities. And the truth is that that's not the case. When you look at, and, and we finally looked at um, what we're doing in, and from, from uh, the black-white uh, treatment and outcome side, what we saw was improvement in both parallel lines though, that, that weren't coming, coming closer, any closer. Um, and even when we provided equality in treatment, which we, we are, we're not seeing equity in outcomes. And that's what matters. And so like Kevin, we picked blood pressure control. Uh, Kevin, I think it saves more lives 
Uh, but we pick uh, blood pressure control, where 22% of our um, African American uh, elderly patients have severely uncontrolled hypertension, uh, one fifth, over 150 over 90, compared to 14% of our white seniors. And we said we're going to cut that disparity in half. Um, but we have to explicitly look at it, measure it, trend it, track it, and motivate against it if we want to make progress through it. Just doing general population health isn't going to fix it. Great, thank you. Andy, do you want to go next? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree to that. I think if we were all to double down on a measurement set, and I think when we really think about what Black Lives Matter is pushing for, it's you think of everybody in a well, and if we say, black folks and indigenous Native Americans, they tend to have the worst disparities constantly. If we focus there and we move the bottom of the well up, everybody naturally benefits from that. I think it's a really hard thing for a lot of folks to hear. In California, we have huge disparities with, with Latinx, huge. But working on the bottom means the Latinx population is also served. So we're we're kind of going into this. I we have yet to agree to a measurement set, but I think that that's the right way to go. Also on the incentive side, I, I am so committed to payment reform because I fundamentally believe that will change the entire way we look at our populations. It's no longer about us being paid, it's about us making them healthy and doubling down on that and going in that way. So keeping telehealth payment, moving everyone to payment reform, putting incentives at the top to drop the disparities is essential. And then I would say all of us have to, all of us, have to have to dive in a little bit further into the history that we might have ignored or not known, read the books out there, anti-racism, anti-black racism. I think it, personal exploration as well as systemic exploration is necessary. Great, thanks. And Rebecca, you can start the most important, you know, healthcare is a right, and I don't think we can have legitimate discussions about equity if we deny people healthcare in this country. So we've got to fix that. Second, we have to measure and focus on it. We, we founded the first office of health equity in the South. Um, we measured health equity. We looked at race as a measure. We focused on equity as a chassis. And as a result, we're able to improve outcomes, um, most recently maternal morbidity by 60%. Um, by doing that, really looking at race, you've got to measure it. You've got to report on it. You've got to hold yourself accountable on it. And you've got to train your staff to understand where bias might come in. We've got to change the way the healthcare workforce looks. looks. LSU is committed to that. We're looking at diversity of our healthcare workforce. We have places like Xavier here in New Orleans that is a tremendous institution. How do we partner more? How do we make sure that our medical school class looks like the community we serve? We're committed to that. That has to change. And then I think finally, what are our institutions doing? You know, when Kevin, uh, if Kevin doesn't pay taxes, which I assume you don't because you're doing community benefit or, or our hospitals don't pay, pay taxes, what does that mean for our community? Are those real investments? And are we holding our institutions accountable for uh, their true commitment to the populations they serve and ensure that those those um, those investments don't just lead to new proton beams or new lovely um, wings of a hospital, but actually lead to change. Uh, and then finally, what is our leadership? You know, of course, look who's on this call. What does our leadership look like? And how do we make sure that individuals of color are represented in, on every board and every in every place? And um, and that we hear and we hear and we listen to each other and we reflect on where we are and why we're there. Um, and it's an incredible moment in our country to have COVID coalesce with um, this incredible moment, moment of racial equity and accounting. And so I am very optimistic as far as I said earlier. I think that things are changing and I see a, a much brighter future, uh, despite the fact that it's been so difficult. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for uh, participating in today's panel. It was really a tremendous conversa conversation, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy days to do so. Um, thank you to all of the attendees, and I hope that you'll join us at our next Friday seminar, which is the Friday after Election Day, where we will be talking about what health reform might look like post-election. Thanks, everyone.